In this, our final episode of Compliance Into the Weeds for 2022, Tom and Matt take a deep dive into the Donska Bank settlement. Hello, everyone. Tom Fox and Matt Kelly back with the award-winning Compliance Into the Weeds. Today, Matt, we are going to continue our exploration of Donska Bank, but it had some really intriguing aspects around you know, certification and some other factors you wanted to maybe take a little bit deeper dive on. So what did you see around those issues? Sure, Tom. So I suppose maybe first for the last few people who don't know about Donsk Bank and its history here, I'll give a quick recap of the case. Donsk Bank wound up paying, I believe it is a total of $2.4 billion to regulators that was announced last week, $2 billion in criminal forfeiture from the bank, and another $400 million or so in civil fines and penalties to the Securities and Exchange Commission for letting one of Danske Bank's branches in Estonia run what I think is the largest money laundering scandal ever in history, period, where from 2009 through 2016 or so, 2007 through 2016, Russian nationals who were not living in Estonia were conducting suspicious transactions through the Estonia branch to the tune of, we believe, $230 billion dollars with a B. Most of these Russian nationals who were doing this were either on watch lists because they were cronies and henchmen of Vladimir Putin, or probably they were just cutouts for Vladimir Putin himself and the plundering he has done with Russian assets. But $230 billion, a huge amount of money funneled through this tiny bank in Estonia that Dansk Bank had acquired in 2007. Almost immediately, the executives at Dansk Bank knew that they had a severe problems with customer due diligence, transaction monitoring. For years, they knew about this. They took no action because it would be too expensive and too much of a hassle. So ultimately, this all got kicked into the public discussion around 2017 when media reports came out. Investigations were launched. Executives were fired. Compliance programs were overhauled. And here we are finally with this settlement. Also now, getting back to, Tom, your original question, there is, they pleaded guilty, so there is no deferred prosecution agreement here, but there is a continuing cooperation agreement for three years. And at the end of that, Donsk Bank's executive and the chief compliance officer, the chief executive and the chief compliance officer will both need to certify that the compliance program is reasonably designed and effective at detecting and preventing incidents of money laundering misconduct and bank fraud. This is the first time we've seen the CCO certification for a non-FCPA thing, which I think is interesting. And then there's a whole list of stipulations about what an effective compliance program will need to be able to do. And uh, we can talk about all of that, but it is a huge case in the money laundering world. And we are back yet again to CCO certification as part of these corporate misconduct settlements. So the... Certification, the interesting thing I found, and I applaud the DOJ for trying to craft the certification to fit the crime or the resolution. So that part, I thought, was a good step forward by the DOJ, and I hope they will invoke that going forward. I'm not as afraid of CO certification as you have ex- might be, or at least I have less questions. Let me ask you about the following. Why should or did the United States government take the lead in prosecuting Danske Bank? Danske Bank is essentially the national bank of Denmark. Where on earth were the Danish regulators or criminal authorities in this? Is it because the United States sees itself as the world's banker now and that any offense to the worldwide banking system, the U.S. will take the lead in. I, t- I took a lot of time studying the jurisdictional attributes of this case, and there was jurisdiction. I was somewhat surprised to see Danske Bank actually has ADRs on file in the United States, and they had United States investors. So that gave U.S. authorities enough. But why, why wouldn't, or, or I guess affirmatively, why would the U.S. take the lead in this prosecution? And negatively, why wouldn't the Danish. Let's take them one at a time. Why would the U.S. take the lead here? Because we are, for better or worse, the world's banking system. The dollar is the world's reserve currency. It also, there 
really is almost no major international banking system that doesn't intersect with U.S. banks based largely in New York to clear these banks. There's almost no way that you could do this kind of a large money laundering operation without bumping into the U.S. banking system. And even aside from the ADRs that Dask Bank has trading in New York, they use the U.S. banking system as correspondent banks to do international transactions. Therefore, there's your jurisdiction, too, on bank fraud charges. But ultimately, the Russians were funneling money out of Russia into Estonia, out of Estonia, into Denmark, and then once into Denmark or elsewhere. They Once they were in the Dask Bank orbit, then they used it to eventually get their assets parked in Western accounts up to the point that by the mid-2010s, as I understand it, U.S. banks were telling Dansk Bank, you have problems, we don't want to deal with your customers, we're not dealing with you anymore. And Dansk was starting to get cut off by U.S. banks. So yet again, more proof that the executives at Dansk Bank clearly knew they had big issues they weren't addressing. But why would America do this? Well, because corruption in Russia is a big problem. And it was a big problem back in the 2010s, where you wanted really to curb these sort of abuses, let alone today, where sanctions are the primary tool that Western governments are using to curtail Vladimir Putin and his ambitions for war in Ukraine. Like, Lord help the bank that would engage in this kind of nonsense today and basically doing Putin's dirty work for the in while the war in Ukraine is ongoing. I think the enforcement appetite among Americans and Western banks would be much larger than it even was back then. And it was not insignificant back then. But as to the second question, where was the Danish regulators? That's an excellent question. I think several of them who were on scene at the time of this misconduct are now unemployed. As I understand it, they were fired. Several of the Danish bank executives, Danske Bank executives, I know they were fired, and I think they were targets of criminal investigations in Denmark. And Creepy, the head of the Estonia branch in 2019, he turned up dead while he was cooperating with a criminal investigation. So they believe that was a suicide, believe doing a lot of work in that sentence, but who knows? I think that, Den- I don't know, maybe Denmark coasted on its false sense of we are very transparent. The Nordics are routinely listed as some of the least corrupt countries on earth. I do believe that, but maybe in this particular case, the banks just didn't want to get at Estonia and the problems there. And the Danish regulators did send them some warnings, but then took no real action. Nothing was happening. Somebody somewhere had to do something. And the United States definitely does see Russian corruption and Russia's geopolitical aims is one and the same or joined at the hip. So you're going to wind up, if you want to push back against Vladimir Putin and his evil intentions, you have to attack where his money goes. That was true then. It is 10 times as true today. Um, but that's my back of the envelope analysis of where was Denmark during all that. One more thing for our audience's consideration. Does, did it allow the Danish authorities to say, <clears throat> to Donske Bank and indeed the country of Denmark, oh, th- this was the Americans who overreached. We we wouldn't do that. I just throw that question out there. Another thing that you spent some time writing about, or as I would say, put ink to paper on your second blog about Donske Bank, and that was the failure of the company to integrate the ERP system. Yeah. And y- you tagged that as a key marker for not where it all went wrong because it went wrong in lots of ways, but maybe a place where it really started, they could have changed. But after that, there was really no for the corporate office to have the visibility or if anybody in Estonia actually wanted to do the right thing, have the ability to do the right thing. What t- what was it you saw in the tech solution that was so troubling? That there wasn't one, first off, and that's troubling. But the real issue here was that the Estonia branch which was, I think, originally called Sampo Bank, and uh, then Dansk Bank acquired it in 2007. So the Estonia branch did not have any automated customer due diligence processes and no automated transaction monitoring, which maybe you could try and make that argument in 2007. It was a long time ago that you could still do these duties manually. I don't think it was true then. It is not true now. But um, without that visibility by using automated technology, which absolutely did exist back then, 
without that visibility, you really didn't have any sense of what your compliance risks are. So you had a lot of nice looking procedures written down on paper, but nothing that actually put them in a force. So it was a paper compliance program. And that's part one of the problem. But then part two is that Donsk Bank's executives immediately by 2008 knew that this was a problem, that we should bring the Estonia branch onto our own central IT system, which does have automated transaction monitoring, does have automated customer due diligence processes, and we should integrate the Estonia operations onto it. They clearly knew that is what they should do. That's what they did with all the other branches that they had throughout Europe. But they didn't do it because it was going to be too expensive and too much of a hassle. So that is poor tone at the top and poor commitment to a compliance program. So you had the weakness in that more ephemeral, touchy-feely, we are doing this because we believe compliance is good, tone at the top stuff. And you had weakness in the actual mechanics of the compliance program because it was all done manually when everybody knew that a manual process was just a bunch of malarkey and baloney. So it really, that decision, I thought, neatly captured both ends of how you could screw up a compliance program. You don't have a strong commitment to it. And even if you didn't have the right tools and mechanics to put it into force, they didn't have either of those things. And look at what happened. The biggest money laundering scandal in, I think, world history. If somebody <laughs> somewhere has laundered more than $230 billion, please let me know. But I don't think I saw that anywhere else. It was it was a terrible failure, just deep and systemic. The settlement or the resolution documents pointed to an independent expert appointed by Denmark to oversee this. What were your thoughts on that role? Is it the equivalent of a monitor? I was intrigued by the language which says that if the independent expert quit for any reason, the DOJ could step in and impose a monitor. What yeah, are your thoughts they, on that? I did see that too. So that struck me as independent expert is just Danish for compliance monitor, because it seems like that is what this person is going to be doing, or in fact has done, because the Danish banking authorities appointed that independent expert in 2021. So they are still there. But if they do leave for some reason, then yes, the DOJ has the right to step in and appoint a monitor. Even aside from that, though, we have to remember that there are ongoing reporting duties Donsk Bank has to make to the Justice Department, regardless of what expert or monitor is where in Denmark or the United States or anything like that. Throughout this whole three-year cooperation period, the Donsk Bank needs to make three annual progress reports every December of 2023, 24, 25, mapping out what Donsk Bank has done to impl implement and maintain a strong compliance program. I think there are quarterly meetings along the way with DOJ just to show what they are doing to improve the compliance program. There have to be work plans that are drawn up and they're provided to the Justice Department that they can review and comment on. So even in this absence of a compliance monitor, as we would think of it in the United States, is this independent expert one or not? It sounds like it to me, but even aside from that, there is still going to be close and ongoing supervision and reporting from Donsk Bank to the Justice Department throughout this whole three-year deal, which then finally, in December of 2025, caps off with the CEO and CO certifying that, yes, their compliance program is effective and reasonably designed to prevent incidents of bank fraud. The Finally, the kind of overall scope of this resolution, we did get a criminal guilty plea out of it. Do you think that the resolution either answered the questions that we had about how this was allowed to occur, or more importantly, gives the bank a chance to fix it and fully remediate going forward. I do think it gives them a chance to fully remediate because we are now starting to get a better sense of what these CCO certifications will entail. So, Tom, you've talked about this before, I think. In all of these settlements, FCPA or AML or presumably others that we'll see down the pike, you have a Schedule C, which is the compliance program. And that is what you have to implement. And then you certify that you have reasonably designed it to prevent the offenses. And Schedule C is pretty exhausting in what the department expects to see. So what I was thinking through was if you have a 
paper compliance program where the tools and mechanics of it and the internal control activities are non-existent. If you have that, if you have tone at the top that is pretty much absent or just not engaged in compliance and you have to solve these problems, then what parts of Schedule C would really make the most sense to focus on? And there's a couple of things that struck me as I was thinking about the Donsk Bank case. For example, one item in Schedule C talks about the importance of disciplinary procedures and they need to implement appropriate disciplinary measures for violations of the program. Those procedures need to be applied consistently and fairly, regardless of the position held. So that would be one good way for the tone at the top to improve for executives at the senior level to show we're serious is a good enforcement of discipline. Up to and including, I think, maybe auditing the disciplinary problem practices and making sure that you have documentation about who was disciplined for what and why did they get when they did, why did they not? You want to quantify that maybe by seniority level just to show that discipline is consistent and fairly applied throughout the entire operation. Schedule C also talks a lot about executive compensation and incentive-based. Another way to show that the tone at the top is serious about compliance, we're going to give you the pay incentives, executives, mid-level managers. We're going to give you compensation structures that drive you to think about compliance. So the I think the language there is that Each bank executive is evaluated on what the executive has done to assure that the executive's department is in compliance with the compliance program. I was interested to see that Schedule C talks more in an affirmative way. How are you encouraging people to comply? It wasn't really saying much about the negative in reinforcement of the clawbacks. There wasn't any mention of clawbacks in Schedule C or anywhere else that I could see that if you have a failure, we're going to claw back your incentive compensation you might have received. And that was strange because the department is talking about clawbacks and there wasn't any mention of it in Schedule C. How do you discipline people? How do you pay them? How do you give them incentives to think about compliance? Those all point to the strong tone at the top. And you still have, on the other side, all of these policies and procedures that are written down, but not actually enforced. How would you address that? And I was thinking a lot that really this is just about the collection of evidence that compliance officers will need to think about and compile, because that's how you're going to go to the department and say, see, our program is designed well, it is working well, it has prevented all these incidents, look at all this data we have to show how well we're performing. And there's probably a lot that we could talk about there on some other podcast another day, but really it's... What evidence do you have that your program is busy and effective and moving in the right direction? And what are the things that would really show the tone at the top is serious about compliance? That's what you'd have to think about, whether you're Donsk Bank or anybody else. And that that kind of was where I was going with my second blog post about Donsk Bank. I was absolutely thrilled to read that because it gave me the opportunity to end our last podcast for 2022 with the immortal words, document, document. Of course, happy to do it. (laughs) All right. Thanks and looking forward to starting back up in 2023. All right. Farewell. This is Tom Fox again. Thank you for listening to this episode of Compliance Into the Weeds. I hope you'll plan to join us again in 2023 for another year of the award-winning podcast series, which takes a deep dive into the weeds of a compliance topic.